All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation. So in the true spirit of this workshop, I'm going to give a talk now about deep learning and combinatorial optimization, and basically how we can use combinatorial optimization to make neural networks smaller. Because sometimes we need to train neural networks that are sufficiently large to get some level of accuracy, and then to make them fit in a computer, we, we might need like, a different computer, like in a smaller device, we might need to we might have a packing problem, which is basically the same thing that would happen if we were coming to this conference in person and had to pack a bag. Uh, especially on the way back, for example, the last time I was at IPAM, I did find a very good sale in the bookstore, which was not good for my bag. Now, this is joint work with Abhinav Kumar from Michigan State University and Sri Kumar Marmaligan from Google Research. So in this talk, we're going to consider feed-forward neural networks as basically mapping a function from an input space X to an output space Y. And I'm going to further assume that all the neurons are going to be rectified linear units, where the output is given by the maximum between zero and then a fine transformation of the inputs given by the weights and the bias when we train the neural network. And thinking in terms of the analogy with biological neurons, we can see that a rebu is inactive when the maximum is obtained with the first term and that the ReLU is active when the maximum is obtained with the second term, and therefore we have a positive output from the neuron. Now, the question that we're interested in here is whether we can find a neural network with fewer, fewer neurons and perhaps fewer layers that can establish the same mapping from X to Y. And to make this question slightly easier to solve, especially given the fact that whenever you use optimization, having bounded inputs helps. What if we consider equivalence only if we're, with respect to uh, inputs that are relevant for a given application? So we're not talking about any X mapping to Y, we're talking about X belonging to a set capital X of inputs that might happen in practice. And to contextualize that with one example, a classic one, let's think about the MNIST data set. The MNIST data set is a collection of images of handwritten digits. There are 28 by 28 images. And along every dimension, we're going to get a value between zero and one. So basically, we don't care what happens if one of the inputs is negative or greater than one, because that's never going to happen in practice. So that's one case where restricting the inputs is not a problem, among many other cases. Now. There is a lot of work on compressing neural network. Sebastian, Sebastian Pokuta just mentioned one about lottery tickets hypothesis, and there are lots of other works along that same line right now. And in fact, there is an extensive literature on what I'm calling here inexact compression. And we want to compress neural networks, first of all, because we want to embed them in smaller devices, for example, wearables, mobile cell phones, for example. And we know for a while now that Trained neural networks may present some redundancy between the network parameters. Whereas if we find a low rank approximation of the weight matrix, for example, we might obtain neural networks with better compressed neural networks with better generalization bounds. But also it's widely known, and for example, mentioned in a recent survey that there is a trade-off between compression and accuracy. The smaller you make a neural network, the less accuracy you're going to get in the end. Although there is a lot of work right now on, making, on obtaining smaller neural networks where in which the overall accuracy is still similar or even better than before. But that brings us to another issue with inexact compression, which is compressed neural networks may be less robust. And if there's some loss in accuracy for particular cases, we're going to see this, this, this loss being disproportionately distributed across classes. So for example, we may have an improvement in accuracy for the majority class, but worsening in the accuracy for minority classes, which might also raise issues of fairness. And there's a growing body of work on compression using optimization formulations like we're going to use here, especially in the area of inexact compression. And I mentioned one paper here because it's also using mixed integer programming the same way that we use in our work, uh, but there's a lot more as well. Now, if we talk about exact compression, that's a relatively unexplored topic. And the advantage of that, uh, and it's important because, and it's an important topic because we can avoid the side effects that I just mentioned about um, uh, the loss of accuracy being disproportionately affecting 
part, just part of the inputs. And also because we don't have to retrain the neural network once we remove neurons, for example, like we're essentially preserving the same mapping from X to Y. So there's no need for, for retraining as in classic compression it is. Now, the one thing I should mention is that this is really relative, this is really unexplored right now. We're almost over with this slide, but they still have space to cover all the related work. As far as I understand, there is one paper in the upcoming ICLR conference about identifying symmetry in graph neural networks. And there is a paper that we presented last year on compressing small rectifier networks at CPI AWAR. And that's it. So there isn't much going on here, as far as I'm, I, I'm concerned. But we're going to discuss now how we can scale this work that we did earlier to larger rectifier networks. And the way that we're going to be able to compress the neural networks is by identifying neurons that are what we call stable. So we're going to say that a neuron is stably inactive if it never produces a positive output. So no matter what input X from the set capital X you send through the neural network, you're going to get an output which is uh, the, the pre-activation output, which is the fine transformation before taking the max, is going to be always smaller than or equal to zero. And you can imagine that in this case, things get very simple because the output of the neuron is always zero. Now we can also have neurons being stably active, which means that no matter what input we send through the neural network, the pre-activation output G is going to be greater than or equal to zero, which means that the output of the neural network equals the pre-activation output. And in both of these cases, what's going to help us so much is the fact that, this, that there is no non-linearity in the ReLU. Like the key to make a neural network express very complex functions is that we have a non-linear component in every neuron, which is the activation function. But if, the neural net, if a particular neuron is basically doing a linear mapping from one space to another, then we can potentially simplify the neural network. But okay, um, if we can tell that certain neurons are stable, that's great. We can do certain, we, we will discuss later operations that we can do with that. But the million dollar question here is, how can you tell that a neuron in the neural network is stable across any possible inputs? And as you may imagine, this is where we're going to use optimization in this work. So if we think about, if we maximize the pre-activation output over all the inputs that we can send for the neural network, for, so for any X in the set capital X, and this pre-activation output ends up being always smaller than or equal to zero, that means that the neuron is stably inactive. Whereas if we minimize the same pre-activation output over any valid input, and the output of that is always greater than or equal to zero, that means that the neuron is stably active. And in both of these cases, we can basically formulate a mixed integer linear program to map the inputs to the outputs of a trained neural network as a way to solve these optimization problems. And the way that this is going to look like, at least for each one of the neurons of the neural network, is a set of, of constraints like we're seeing right now. And we can, there's actually a lot of work on formulating optimization problems on top of trained neural networks. And in fact, I suspect that Joey is going to talk a little bit about that in his talk later today. So I'm not going to discuss this in much detail other than saying that in these formulations, the inputs of the neural network and the outputs of every neuron are decision variables. And we also have this special decision variable here, which is the binary variable Z telling whether for the values of the inputs that we're currently considering, the neuro, this particular neuron is active or not. That's the only one, the only thing I wanted to remember from this particular slide. And the way that this binary variable Z works is as follows. Uh, Z is going to be zero whenever we're talking about inputs for which the pre-activation output is smaller than or equal to zero. And then the output is going to be zero. And Z is going to be one whenever the pre-activation output is greater than or equal to zero, which means that the output and the pre-activation output have the same value. Now, well, I just gave you two objective functions. I told you how we're going to set up these constraints. And if we were in person, maybe someone would be standing up right now because what I'm proposing here is just preposterous. Solving two MIOPs per neuron is not that cheap, at least not if we're talking about sufficiently large neural networks where this is going to start being interesting for us. Well, we know that, but 
Given that, we should try it. And that's what we got in our first paper. Basically, what we did back then was if we had a negative upper bound for the maximization problem or a positive lower bound for the minimization problem, we would stop because we would, we would have enough information already. And the runtime to identify stable neurons for MNIS classifiers in that case was as follows. So for two hidden layers of 25 neurons each, it took about 30 seconds. For two hidden layers of about 100 neurons each, it took 400 seconds. Now, this is not a node computer I'm talking about. This is in fact taking a lot more time than it takes to actually train the neural network, which is not great. And that's why we needed to scale this up. And there are a couple of insights about this compression problem that we're considering that are going, that's going to help, that, and, this, that, and these insights are going to help us a lot here. The first one is that we're solving all of these problems over the same, same feasible set. The constraints of this problem are basically how to map the input to the output of the neural network. So it's those constraints that I discussed before for every neuron of the neural network. The second one is that it's easy to certify that a neuron is not stable. So certifying that a neuron is stable entails that we solve that an optimization problem and by finding the optional solution. So basically like by proving the correctness of the algorithm and the steps that were taken, that there is no way to make that neuron active or inactive, for example. Now, if you're talking about certifying that a neuron is not stable, it just takes two inputs to the neural network. One, that when you send through the neural network is going to make the neuron active. And another one that when you send through the neural network is going to make the neuron inactive. And in fact, we can use one neural network input to certify multiple neurons at the same time. So we're basically going to reframe the optimization problem that we're going to solve here as a different one. We're trying to look for an input of the neural network that's going to produce an unobserved state in the maximum number of neurons. So we're going to look at, we're going to go over all the inputs. So we're optimizing over the possible inputs that are valid for us. And we're going to check whether we're going to find a, post, a non-negative pre-activation output for neurons in a set P of, in a set P of neurons that which we have not seen being active yet. So the, those are neurons that we don't know if they can be ever active. So we're looking for situations in which they're active, inputs that will make them active. Likewise, we're going to look for, for some other neurons. We're going to look at uh, whether it's possible to make them inactive by looking at the pre-activation output, which is smaller than or equal to zero. And those neurons will be in a set queue of neurons that we have not been seeing inactive yet. Putting this all together, we have the set, let's say capital P of neurons that were not active yet, capital Q of neurons that we have not been seeing inactive yet. And for each, for the neurons in each one of these sets, we're going to define these variables P and Q. And here's the objective function that we're going to consider from now on. Basically, we're trying to look at an, at an input that's going to maximize um, the number of neurons in a different state, in a state that we haven't seen yet. And if by trying to solve this optimization problem, we get um, that the optimal value is zero, then we know that every neuron in the set P is stably inactive and every neuron in the set Q is stably active. Whereas if we get some positive value for this, for, for this optimization problem, we know that we're one step closer to identifying stable neurons because we're going to remove neurons from either the set P or the set Q. Now, in fact, we don't have to solve this problem more than once. If you remember what I mentioned before, we only need to solve a problem to optimality to prove stability. So that's only when we get the values of zero. If we get any positive solution along the way, that solution contains, is associated with an input that's activating neurons that with states that, that is producing in some neurons states that we haven't observed before. So that's going to help us. We don't need to find an optimal solution in that case. And every time that we find a solution like that, what we can do is when we're solving this problem in a MIP solver, we can implement a lazy constraint callback so that for every feasible solution that is found, we can add, we can inspect these variables P and Q to see which um, neurons have presented a new state and then add valid cuts, val valid inequalities, basically just setting this, these variables to zero so that they can, they can no longer have uh, one value anymore. And then we keep, we keep rolling this up to the point where 
we are going to prove that the optimal solution for the variables that are left has a value of zero. And in addition to that, we can also relax these new binary variables that we're creating if we consider the integrality of z. So putting it all together, we have this new objective function maximizing the sum of the p's and q's. Uh, we have the constraints mapping inputs to the outputs of the neural network, nothing new here. And the variable p for every neuron that we want to see active is going to be bound between zero and the variable binary variable z, telling if the neuron is active or not. And the variable q is going to be bound between zero and one minus z. And now there, the cherry on top of all of this that I just mentioned is a very simple but very powerful observation by Fischetti and Joe, which is that if you have an input for the, a valid input for the neural network, you have a, you have a feasible solution for the MIOP formulation on the trained neural network, which it's not that complicated, but if you think about it, but in general, when we're talking about mixed integer linear programming, finding a feasible solution is an NMP complete problem. And the fact that finding a feasible solution for the formulation that we're considering here is easily done can actually help us a lot. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to look at the input that comes out of solving the linear relaxation of this formulation. So basically if we fix um, the variables, the input variables should be exactly the same as in the linear relaxation. That's going to imply one feasible MIOP solution that can be easily found by the solver. Or basically, if you just send that input for the neural network, you're going to see the activations and compute it. And this solution is somewhat guided by the objective function, not perfectly because we are relaxing the binary variable Z, but still, this is going to push us towards the activating neurons or inactivating neurons to obtain states that we haven't observed. And we can get one of those at every node of, of the branch and bound tree. And in, in practice, when we were running experiments, we did observe that uh, when there were very few um, neurons in which we haven't observed the state, doing that would speed up things considerably. So when we look at the run times now, they look a lot better. So here is a scatter chart of how um, the, uh, the run times of our new approach look like in the y-axis compared to what the work that presented the CPIOR last year in the X axis. The colors here are being used for the amount of regularization used when training the neural network. We're going to discuss that later. For now, I just want to focus here on the, on the difference in run times. If we look at neural networks with, the, with two hidden layers of 25 neurons each, the median speed up was of 15 times. And as we make these neural networks larger, the speed up actually increases. So when we have two hidden layers of 100 neurons each, now it's 39 times faster to identify all the stable neurons, which is great. So I just told you that we were able to scale up this process of detecting whether neurons in the neural network are stable. Now, how can we use these stable neurons to make the neural network smaller? So let's walk through some operations that we can do that are going to produce essentially the same neural network for us. The first one is when a neuron is stably inactive. In that case, we know that the output of this neuron is always zero, so it never affects the pre-activation outputs of the neurons in the next layer or the output of the neural network as a whole. So we can, be, we can easily remove these neurons from the neural network, and that's it. Now, if the entire layer is stably inactive, then, like before, we can now tell that the output of this layer is basically a vector of zeros, which means that the output of the network is actually constant and defined by the parameters that come later, which actually means that we can remove all the hidden layers of the neural network. Now, we're not going to observe this in practice unless your neural network is very bad, like it basically just has a constant output. But this is just for the sake of completeness. Now, here's a situation that we may actually see in practice, which is when we have an entire layer being stably active, especially if we remove the neurons that are stably inactive around it. In that case, the output of this layer is an affine transformation of its inputs, which means that for, a, for any neuron that you look in the next layer, um, the pre-activation output can be redefined as an affine function on the inputs of the preceding layer. So basically we can rewire the neural network to connect the layer before the stable layer to the layer after it, and effectively remove this layer from the neural network. This is what we call folding the, the, 
the layer. And finally, we may also have a situation in which some, but not all neurons in a, in a particular layer are stably active. So in that case, for those neurons, we have an affine transformation coming through the neuron uh, when you go through them. And if the rank on the weights uh, of, this, of these neurons uh, is smaller than the number of neurons, then we know that there is some linear dependency between the outputs of these neurons, which means that we can basically adjust the parameters of the neural network so that we have the same effect um, being applied to the pre-activation outputs of the neurons in the next layer. And by doing that, we can get rid of some of these stably active neurons if there is some uh, rank deficiency in the weights. And One minute left. Okay. Five more minutes. All right. Now, final question here is, Okay, I have told you how we can identify um, how we can identify stable neurons, what we can do if they exist. But the, the million the, the, the important question here now is how are we going to find stable neurons? Well, it turns out that if you use L1 regularization, we can induce stability in the neural network. And this has been used um, to train to, to, to make these networks more robust. And the way that it works is that L1 regularization is going to drive the weights down. And if the bias is negative, we're likely to have a stably inactive neuron. And likewise, if the bias is positive, we're likely to have a stably active neuron. And now if we put some, like, and one thing that we know in general is that if we put some regularization, but not too much, that actually improves, improves the accuracy of the trained neural network. So in the experiments we first are going to discuss here, um, the case of MNIST classifiers. And what we did with them is we just looked for an amount of regularization that actually goes a little past the ideal. So we're going to get an accuracy that's basically the same as no regularization in the neural network. So that's the amount of regularization capital um, under um, L bar. And we're also going to check what happens when we have uh, half of that amount of regularization, which is a situation where we're expecting the accuracy to get to, to, be, to be higher. And here's what happens when we look at two hidden layers of 100 neurons, and then we keep adding more and more layers. So you can see that if there is no regularization, we basically cannot do anything about exact compression, at least not with stability. Uh, if we have so much regularization that we're back at the same amount of accuracy, and here are the accuracies in case you're curious about them, they're about the same. Um, we can remove about 25% of the neurons. And in terms of connections, that's about 40%. And in the middle here, we have the sweet spot. That's where we can have the cake and eat it too. Basically, we're training the neural networks with just a little bit of accuracy, enough that improves our, uh, our but, but it's also enough that we can actually remove some of the neurons from the neural network later. And we can remove about 15% of the neurons by doing that. And here we have somewhat similar results in which instead of adding layers, we're actually doubling the width of the two hidden layers. And in terms of run times, this is much better than before. Uh, and what there, we can observe here is that- Can I ask what, there's one question in the chat in the meanwhile. So Eli asked if there are any theoretical guarantees on the minimum or maximum number of active or inactive neurons in general. Just Good point. Here. Um, not that I'm aware of, but that's, that's an interesting question. Okay. So then maybe for the discussion. All right. So, so in terms of run times, uh, as you can see here, we, we dropped from 400 seconds to 14 seconds for the, in the case of two times, uh, 100. And what we can observe here is that compared to no regularization, um, so I told you that we can have the cake and eat it too, but using this amount of regularization that improves accuracy and allows us to do compression actually makes the runtime the run times higher. And if we actually have more and more regularization, the run times then go, go down. So we can see that it's generally easier to identify stable neurons if we have more regularization when we're past this point. And the other thing that we observed that was very interesting is that when there is some regularization being used, no matter how much, there is a direct relationship between the size of the neural network after compression and the accuracy of the neural network, which is even more meaningful than, um, than the relationship with the amount of regularization used. And 
Finally, we have some experiments on autoencoders. And with autoencoders, where we, where we basically have like layers of different widths, and one of them usually is very small, and we can expect it to be stable. What we did was we actually applied a lot of regularization just to see what would happen. And what, what happened with three hidden layers is that the first two hidden layers were fo fold, in most cases before the loss doubled. And here, the first set of experiments, basically we start with no regularization. Then we add some amount that just make the loss, a just increases a little bit the loss. And then we add 10 times more than that. And what we're observing here is that we, we, we are left with a neural network that has between five and 10% the number of neurons. So we're removing almost everything, folding two of the hidden layers. And these are experiments with, in which we just changed the width of the, hit, of the bottleneck layer, the layer in the middle. Now here are results in which we actually fixed the bottleneck layer and just changed the width of the other two layers, the first and the third. And you can see that the figures are about the same. And when we look at the runtimes here, that's where things get very interesting. I mentioned to you that the more regularization we use, the easier it is to solve these problems. So here, it's basically a drop of 40 to 50 times in runtimes when we, when we consider the case of in which we have a lot of regularization. So for the first set of experiments, we were able to run in three seconds, everything. For the second set here, it, it went from one to 10 seconds, but it was a lot faster than anything else, which means that Maybe we could, what we could do here on purpose is we could train a neural network with so much regularization that this is hurting our accuracy, just because in the end, we can actually make it a lot smaller. And then we could, it would make more sense to compare with other small net neural networks as, as well. And as we can see, this is the easiest case in terms of runtimes. It runs very quickly because it's easy to identify stable neurons when we have so much regularization. And with that, we get to the end of the talk. So the takeaways here are, we came up with this general purpose exact compression method, which scales to networks large enough for practical use, runs faster than training the neural network, which is important and now it works. And in a nutshell, what we're doing here, we're removing and merging neurons, folding layers, and in very extreme and unlikely scenarios, collapsing the network. We're doing that when we train these neural networks with any amount of L1 regularization. And we're doing that because um, the, these stable neurons have a linear behavior, which allows us to simplify the neural network. And the way that we're doing that is by solving an optimization problem. Because whenever you need it, mixed integer programming is there for you. Thank you very much.